can I uh, say just how nice it is to get to talk to you all again, um, uh, meet so many old friends. I hope that sometime this year we'll all get to meet uh, in person rather than virtually. And uh, can I congratulate uh, Alejandra and Jack and all the panelists on the earlier panels for fascinating debate and importantly for finishing on time. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Helen Nissenbaum for the closing keynote today. Um, Helen has a background in mathematics and philosophy, and she's a professor of information science at Cornell University and a leading researcher and thinker in the fields of privacy and security. 15 years ago, she was one of the creators of Track Me Not, which was one of the first browser extensions to help protect um, users' privacy when using the web. Helen is co-author of a paper about online manipulation and manipulative practices that was published last year in the Georgetown Technology Review. And the paper contains a masterful survey of different ways in which people can be influenced, and it shows us why some of the influencing techniques are legitimate and why some should be regarded as unethical and harmful. There's a lot to learn from the paper, and it, I believe it should be required reading for policymakers who want to protect user interests in the online world, particularly in the light of the way that AI can be used to manipulate users. I was privileged to hear Helen speak about these issues at a session at Harvard earlier this year, and I'm really pleased she's agreed to join us today. And after hearing her talk, I hope you will agree with me that the issue of online, online manipulative practices is something that should be addressed as the EU institutions consider further not only the Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act, which has just been discussed, but also particularly the Artificial Intelligence Act. Uh, I've, after hearing Helen, it, it became a, something of a mission for me to get this onto the agenda in Europe this, um, you know, during those discussions. So um, if I can hand over to Helen and uh, invite her to give the talk, Helen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and um, hi everybody. I, this is not uh, a group that I normally am familiar with or have spoken with, um, so I'm, I'm doubly honored to be here and to present this work. And thank you so much, Jeremy, for that <clears throat> very super generous introduction. Uh, this work on uh, digital manipulation, I'm just wondering, um, there is, yes, okay, great. I want to grab more of the screen so I can see what I'm talking about. And I uh, understand that uh, if I want, I would just ask for the next slide to follow, but <clears throat> right now, um, as Jeremy mentioned, this is work that I've done and um, it's worked together with two other collaborators uh, and, and you'll see their names in a little while, but Beata Rusler, who's a professor of philosophy um, at the University of Amsterdam, and Daniel Sasser, who is a professor of philosophy and um, technology, ethics and technology at Penn State University in Pennsylvania. Um, he, I think I mentioned his, it's the first time I've, I've worked with uh, three philosophers. Now we were, we were all inspired by what we're seeing. All of us have been doing work on privacy and ethics and technology, but we were, we, all three of us realized we really affected, very much affected by some of what's going on um, on digital platforms and generally on the web and online. So if I could have the next slide. Um, I okay, all right. So um, some of you may have seen this, this particular instance where it came to light that Facebook had told advertisers that um, just based on how teens were operating online or on Facebook platform, they could uh, see moments when, when, when teens were questioning themselves and felt vulnerable and low confidence and they thought, oh, this could be a good moment to advertise to them. And generally speaking, and if I could have the next slide, um, we were all, all of us, ourselves, the three of us, um, sorry, next slide. Is there a way I can operate the slides from here? Uh, yeah, um, thanks. So we were inspired by real world cases, of course, there was the Facebook um, targeting ads to vulnerable teens. There was uh, 
of course, many of us are familiar with the Cambridge Analytica, where uh, people were uh, kind of shunted to fake news websites and manipulated in political views. There was uh, there's Uber has um, has ways of manipulating their drivers by uh, using means that are commonly now called uh, dark patterns where they would send certain kinds of teasers or they would show incorrectly that certain areas of a city um, there was high demand and so search areas where they could charge search prices but then when the drivers got there it, it wasn't the case because in fact uber it serves uber's interests to have a lot of drivers in certain places so we considered these all um, to be uh, manipulative now we also motivated by prior research and scholarship and we can move to the next slide where there were there was already a lot of really interesting work being done um, in by people like Alessandro Aquisti and Laura Brandemarte, uh, Ryan Kahlo and so on, who were already looking at manipulate, manipulation via digital media platform services, workplaces, uh, Uber as an example of manipula manip manipulation of gig workers. There's a, a quite a long trajectory of purely philosophical work on manipulation that's uh, conducted by ethicists, not necessarily in the context of digital media. Um, and we have our own, the three of us have been working separately in on issues of profiling and privacy and so forth. So we, we decided that actually we need a, a more rigorous understanding of manipulation. We, we felt that our own work on privacy and data practices and so forth was important, but it didn't address this notion of manipulation. And we didn't think that any of the other work, as important as it was, either fit the application area very well or was rigorous enough for the to to justify ethical analysis or even policy analysis. So um, we, we, we forged ahead and we wanted to create a definition of manipulation. Now, um, if we could move to the next slide, uh, we, oh, um, okay, sorry, there's just a little bit of, doesn't matter, but um, we wanted to try and present a concept of manipulation that was rigorous, that was true to the meaning of the term. And at the same time, distinguish practices that looked potentially manipulative, but didn't fit that definition. And then offer the conceptual account that it could be fuzzy, often this happens with important concepts, but that it could nevertheless inform ethical judgment policy and um, system design, because we were all interested in that. And, and the little notice, this little um, caption is because we realized that the term manipulation is a success concept, which means in order to point and say this manipulates, you also have to show not only what the practice is, but the outcome. And we we didn't feel that we had enough empirical work on the other side to make that link, but we thought it was nevertheless important to develop this concept of manipulative practice. And um, as you see in the next slide, we have uh, a definition of manipulative practice, which is, uh, and this I'm going to, go, there's a lot of this uh, worked out in the slide, in the, in the, in the article, but I'm going to be very quick to say that what we found to be key to our definition of manipulative practice, and I'm not going to read the slide, I'm going to be assuming that you're reading some of this material while I'm talking, is that whatever the action is, it's hidden, the, the influence that's being imposed on people is covert, it's hidden, and it 
an attempt to affect a person's decision-making processes in ways that are not that are subliminal to human consciousness. Now that's fine, and this this is this could be a philosophical analysis, but what we were really keen to explain is why digital technology, and next slide, um, I call it the digital technology turbocharge, because the question is, if you accept this definition of manipulative practice as um, hidden or covert influence on another person's decision making, and all of this, by the way, is a little bit contentious, but I won't go into it here, is what is it about digital technology that makes it so critical that we think specifically about manipulative practices? And in this case, the definition becomes the use of digital technology to covertly influence another person's decision making. And what we argue about digital technology is that it makes concealment, the concealment aspect is easily achieved, that digital technology can exploit general human vulnerabilities and a lot of the work here in dark patterns is revealing this, and that digital technology exploits and discovers individual vulnerabilities. And I love this Ryan Kahlo quote, which is, firms will increasingly be in the position to create suckers rather than waiting for one to be born. Okay, so now a little bit of elaboration on the next slide, because this, this is really at the heart of the presentation about digital technology. You know, what's so lethal about digital technology is that on the one hand, digital technology is outstanding at discovering these vulnerabilities because of the 360 degree surveillance, um, multiple party aggregation, seamless profiling. We have platforms and there's this dynamic interactivity with platforms which allows lightning A-B testing to take place. Oh, are people more likely to press a, a red button or a green button? Um, the creation of suckers and I think we've seen how difficult and just hearkening to the previous panel, it's almost impossible to convey to people what your data practices are and pretty easy to get them to consent. So, so this is critical in the arena. And a third aspect of discovery is that digital technology likes to disappear. It's a mediating technology. So um, this is from my colleague, Daniel Susser. It's more like eyeglasses. It's not like a magnifying. The importance is that you forget that you're even doing this via technology and you fail to recognize that it's actually having an impact in the way you see the world. And this affects the way the digital technology can deliver manipulation, which is it can deliver a view of the world. This is what we saw in the US in the 2016 um, elections, which is people were given, they were manipulated into a reality that had them responding in a certain way. It, uh, we can undermine um, reliable assumptions and um, these things can be done at scale. So now when we take this definition and we return, um, next slide, and, and, and uh, when I've presented before, I, I would take actually a poll to say, well, what do you think about are these manipulative practices, but I, I won't uh, do it today. I'll just tell you how our definition plays out in these different cases so you can flip to the next slide. Um, and uh, you can see how we come out on these different cases. Now, I, I'm happy to discuss, but I know that my time is uh, relatively short. And uh, what I wanted to get to what I think might be of interest to this community, which is one question, is digital manipulation unethical? And our answer is yes, it is. Oh, sorry, go to the next slide. Um, and then um, you can flip to the next slide. What we argued, and, and this uh, really um, 
I, I want to acknowledge uh, Beata Rusla, who is really the expert in an expert in this, a uh, leading expert, I should say, in the area of philosophical autonomy, which is the casualty of manipulative practice, is autonomy, human autonomy. And the problem with this concept of autonomy, it's often considered to be, you know, some kind of grandiose concept, but it, it really is what we're after in a free society. We need to create space for individuals that they can see that their life can be shaped by themselves, that they can understand what the factors are, they can <clears throat> they can choose values, they can plan what they're going to do. And if they are manipulated, the exercise of autonomy becomes increasingly difficult. Even the ability to vote in a democratic election. And this is why for us, manipulative practices are antithetical to free societies because your brain is manipulated to see reality in a certain way. This article, so the next slide um, is where we got to in the article that um, that we that um, I mentioned, which is this online manipulation, hidden influences in a digital world, and a lot of it's well worked out. And we realized, and we were kind of sorry that we never um, developed the next section of the article. And this is this is where I've been doing some thinking which is, should digital manipulation be regulated? And in my view, and what I'm going to, in the, just in the few minutes that I have remaining today, um, say the answer to that is, yes, it should be, it should be regulated. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the um, Norwegian Consumer Council. They have several really um, incredibly useful report some of them, for example, on mobile location tracking and so forth. But in but they also have done some really important work on dark patterns, the way, um, for example, if you have an Amazon Prime account, it's actually really hard to shut down your Amazon Prime account. Sorry, could you flip? So we could pause for 10 seconds and then to the next slide. Um, uh, this, and this is what I was talking about. Uh, so there are the the Norwegian Council Consumer Council is is strongly critical of some of these manipulative practices, focusing specifically on dark patterns. But I I want to talk more generally about regulating manipulative practices, which I think I don't know how it is in Europe, but in the US it it's going to be an uphill battle. So could we go to the next slide? And I'll explain um, why in the US um, it's, the, it's going to be difficult because it goes against some of the truisms that guide regulation. First of all, the harms, which I talked about in terms of autonomy, they're unclear. They're not like I lost $1,000 or look, I have a physical injury. It's this notion of being a decision maker, choosing your own values, sort of freedom to define your own path and do things for reasons that you determine to be the right reasons to take one action or another. Second of all, um, there's a very strong sense in the US, and again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about Europe, that anything that constrains other people's behavior, so uh, don't don't stop the advertiser from saying whatever they want to say, or other individual liberties. So any attempt to regulate manipulative practice might be um, cut down because of an argument like this. And finally, um, there's a tendency to say, oh, this is paternalistic. You know, people uh, people. Sh don't you don't have to protect people against manipulative practices they they can do it for themselves they can see through it okay next slide now of course uh, i mean there's there's some kind of um um pollyanna-ish optimistic notion um and we know that sometimes we have to protect people against themselves like 
us against ourselves. And so when you're, there is a lot of evidence showing the addictive nature of some of the technologies. Next slide. Uh, we may uh, hear us back to this issue. So these are, these are, you know, these are challenges. And then um, I was, I was really fascinated. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Laura Brandamarti, uh, who I'm, I'm, I mentioned over here, had given a talk in my class, and she was talking about how, in fact, um, one can manipulate, and here the marketing literature has plenty of examples showing that a familiar face much more easily can sell you stuff. So what can AI do for you? You know, here's the, here's, this is her example. We're able to merge faces. So this isn't Alessandro Questi selling you whatever it is that this guy in the middle is trying to sell you, but because we've merged and, and you have a model on the one side, we've merged Alessandro Questi's face with this paid model who's agreed to have his face used. And now you have someone who kind of resembles Alessandro, maybe has that sense of familiarity and you're gonna say, oh, this guy looks trustworthy to me. Yes, I'll buy those, whatever those things are. So there are ways in which manipulation can get to the root of how we think and decide that I believe are problematic. So I'm going to find that my final slide is the next slide, um, which in which I'm going to argue that there are reasons nevertheless to regulate um, against manipulative practices because of the loss of autonomy that's not only harmful to individuals, but also challenges the foundations of free societies that when we that in consumer regulation we we do regulate against deceptive practices but that deceptive can mean a lot more than outright falsehoods and in the US there tends to be a really narrow interpretation of what deceptive practices are and also regulation does happen for severely asymmetric situations in this case of both knowledge and power so we do have regulation against exploitative labor practices or contracts um, individuals are very exposed machines can be very opaque and also these digital practices create novel sources of vulnerability that i think we need to study i don't believe that the gdpr and traditional consumer practice is going to be enough to meet these challenges. Thank you. That's it for me. And I'm delighted, happy to take comments and questions. Thanks very much, Helen. Uh, another tour de force. Um, I'm going to maybe kick off the questions, but can I just say to people in the audience, uh, do type in questions and they'll come up on my screen and I'll I'll put them to Helen. Um, Helen, I was actually very struck with it by your last example, which I don't think, I, I, may, have, I may have forgotten, I don't think you, you'd mentioned yeah. it before, but the, the, idea that, um, the idea that I might be sold something by some kind of, um, composite face that looks a bit like someone I trust and but not so much like someone I trust that I would know that I would absolutely notice the the manipulation of the image that's a, that's I think a great example of the sort of covert manipulation that, that you're talking about um, I was going to ask you just a little bit about uh, about um, the AI regulation that has come that's the proposal that's been put forward in Europe. Um, and and um, I was quite excited when I saw the leaked draft on, from our friends Politico, uh, and then rather less excited when I saw the, the, the final version. Because um, they do talk about subliminal techniques in the, um, in the uh, explanatory note, but they, they, they really limit that in the regulation to techniques that can cause um, psychological or physical harm to people. So nothing like um, the the loss of autonomy that, that you were talking about. And um, the Commission's view is that other manipulative practices can be dealt with by um, data protection, by consumer protection, by digital services legislation, because their argument is that th that legislation ensures that people are properly informed and have um, a free choice not to be subject, uh, just, I'm just reading here from, from, from the proposal, they have a free choice not to be subject to profiling or other practices that might affect their behavior. So I just wonder if you might um, say a little bit more about why you think that that um, the, the, the data protection and consumer protection, uh, you know, is not enough um, 
and, and, and why you think something more specific ought to be uh, ought to be used. Well, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure, you know, it could be that when they use this concept of subliminal, I mean, it, it could be we could meet somewhere in the middle. So if we're saying subliminal, often it, it's like the old fashioned ideas that you're watching a movie and then they flash below your consciousness an image of Coca-Cola and then when at intermission, of course, a lot of people go and buy Coca-Cola. This was the Vance Packard, you know, hidden persuaders. However, if we're willing to, and if, so if they tie that to a narrow definition of harm, then we're in trouble. And when we say harm, we, we say people acting in ways that um, are against their, their benefit or interest. So if, if, if we have a really restricted, but if we can expand subliminal to, uh, into covert, you know, in a way, we could achieve some of that, that, you know, some of what I'm hoping for when we, when we look at um, working against the kind of covert influence that gets underneath our ability to decide. So that's on the one hand. And if we can enlarge what we mean by harm, that also can can be useful for me. In other words, we could go that direction and it could be useful. How do I feel about the data protection? I mean, here, how much time do we have? There's no way you can inform people. I do not agree with informed consent. I think it's a bad approach to data protection. You cannot inform people sufficiently to assume that they're going to make a good decision and even what we're seeing now, when we see these little pop-up dialogue boxes, oh, we're using cookies. And what is that? You know, so I'm not optimistic about that at all. I, I think that we it's time for people who are expert to step in and give a lot more guidance on this. So it's partly, yes, maybe we can achieve something with subliminal. I don't think that um, that aspect of GDPR, or you know, is is getting us far. Okay, thanks, Helen. I think uh, we've got probably time for for one more question. Um, sure. And I remember you talking about how um, manipulation, even if it's potentially in somebody's interests, is also unethical. Um, do you, could you just say a little bit more about that, and maybe give an example of of the sort of thing you had in mind there? Well, I mean, it's 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 about it's about um, um this is the kind of bad paternalism where we maybe push people to do what's good for them uh, but really if you want to develop your full humanity each of us needs to develop our decision making capacities and when we under undermining the decision making capacities i think we're damaging what is essential about humanity. I mean, it's much longer, but I, I, I wanted to be quick. Maybe we could get in another question. I, I don't actually have any more questions from the floor, but, uh, but I, think, um, I think, yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of saying that even if it was, we were trying to promote, say, the take up of COVID-19 vaccines, you would, yes. you would say that, 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 that it would be just as bad to, um, to pop up in people's uh, timelines, um, you know, to to kind of suggest that they take the vaccine at a time when they when they're particularly worried about COVID, rather than <laughs> rather you know to, to make use of, of that, so, so to time to time the the intervention at that time. That 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 is as bad as suggesting they vote for a political party or buy a product. Well, I, th I think that um, that's an interesting point. Because sometimes what we the the layers of manipulative practice and nudge is some i don't know if you're familiar with this work on nudge which is to say um when we uh, if you want to organize a cafeteria to encourage people to take healthy options you um you make sure that you put the salads and so forth at 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 a, at a certain level and then you make them you know bend right down if for that cream cake. And that is manipulative in, in a sense. But as a society, 
And in our moments of clarity, we have acknowledged that this is good for society. So that when we um, impose on people nudges that have ge generally speaking been approved by thinking autonomous human beings, because we know we have weakness of will, then I think that's a different kind of manipulation. It's not a manipulative practice that I would have difficulty with. In, and, there, and there are many sort of safety issues like wearing a, wearing a helmet and so forth. So it has to do with making the decision at a higher order that, yes, we know we're weak of will and scared unreasonably, so we need to, imp we need to insert certain, certain kind of encouragements. We've already agreed on that. In the case of some of the one-sided manipulative practices that are on the web, they're beneficial for some parties and at the expense of other parties, and there hasn't been a societal discussion. So I think this needs to be had. Right, yeah. So the equivalent of the cafeteria rearranging the shelves to, to, to around my my weaknesses in order to sell me something expensive as opposed to having the salads at the same level for everybody. Yes. Um, yeah. I think Helen, that's been a, a, a great, uh, a, a, a great, a great um, exposition. Uh, I'm yeah, a, a quick canter through it. I'm, I'm afraid. I really would encourage people I, I, um, to to uh, read the paper, um, read your paper, because I think um, when I look at the legislative proposals and I look at the um, the the current legislation, this is a big area in which people's autonomy. Um, and interests are affected, and I think, as 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 you said, Helen, it, we can't rely on uh, on um, existing legislation. And at a time when Europe is just um, considering three major pieces of legislation in the digital area: the yeah. Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, and the AI Act, it would be a huge shame if these issues were not thoroughly debated and the right place was found for some regulation on this area. So anyway, thank you very much, Helen. Um, can and I, can I just, you, yeah, 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 please. I just wanted to add one thing. First of all, I'd love everybody to read the article, but be aware that the work of the, the policy um, recommendations are not there and therefore we really need everyone on board here. But at the same time, there's a student of Beata Rusler at the University of Amsterdam in his PhD dissertation has done a really fantastic job. And one of the arguments he's made, because he's very familiar with the EU um, regulatory framework, is that it really, the manipulative practices cannot be addressed. And so I'm going to uh, provide a reference to that and make the connections, but that work is really awesome. Okay, thanks very much, Helen. Um, I've, been, I've been I've been asked. Uh, this is the final session of the day, so um, so the IIC asked me to wrap up the session as well. And uh, and again, thank everybody who spoke, everyone who participated, everyone who asked a question, um, and to uh, to uh, welcome you all back tomorrow morning um, for session the the the, uh, the next session of the day. So I can. Wish you everyone a, a good lunchtime if they're in uh, in America, and a, a good evening and uh, sweet dreams if you're still awake in Australia. Thanks very much, everybody, and uh, goodbye. <laughs>